All right, let's go ahead and begin. Um, it's good to be with you this morning. Let me open us up with prayer. The Lord be with you. Let's pray. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we thank you for um, the privilege that it is to meet as your people. I pray that you would guide us now as we look at your word, that we would um, be edified, and that you would help us to love you more through it. And we pray this in the name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Amen. All right, good morning. So we are in week three of four of Things Jesus Never Said, which is, that's a pretty loaded topic, right? There's a lot of things that Jesus never said. Um, There's an infinite number of things that Jesus never said. We'll come to that in a minute. I am uh, Eric Priest. I am um, the week three. So in week one, you had the Reverend Dr. Jordan Hilden, God will not give you more than you can handle. Last week, uh, Reverend Dr. Jim Jackson, God helps those who help themselves. And next week, uh, we have a special guest, the Reverend Canon Dr. Victor Lee Austin, everything happens for a reason. One of these four is not like the other ones. I am not a reverend doctor, <laughs> but I don't think any of the others could have just played Chariots of Fire for the postlude and family table. <laughs> so I'm just saying I may not have their qualifications, but I got some good things of my own. Um, so I'm just going to give you a disclaimer, and I did not listen to the previous two lessons, and that's because I didn't want to accidentally like go in the same direction as them. So if there's things that I say that coincide with what Jordan said or what Jim Jackson said, we can chalk that up to heavenly providence. If there's things where we disagree, they're the reverend doctor, not me, and that, but you should search the scriptures like the Bereans so you could figure out who's, who's right, or maybe none of us are right, right? So you should trust that the Holy Spirit will guide us into truth. All right, um, so I am a late... Gen Xer or an early millennial, depending on where you draw the lines, which means, I'm just, this is a disclaimer, which means that my natural bent is a little bit towards cynicism. And I have, I've tried to push really hard against that. But if that comes out and I start to get cynical about today's topic, which, spoiler alert, is a little bit too Disney for me, follow your heart as long as you're happy, be true to yourself. Um, if, if that comes out and it's a little bit too much of a downer, I just want you to know that I'm preaching next hour in Riverway on Ruth chapter 4, which is one of the happiest chapters in the entire Bible. There is an engagement, there's a wedding, there's a baby, there's grandchildren. It doesn't get much happier in the Old Testament especially than Ruth chapter 4. So if this is too much of a downer, I'd love to see you next door in the Parish Life Center at 11.15. And I'm also going to apologize um, if the sound gets weird, because this kind of microphone is not made uh, for people to push their long flowing locks behind their ears. And so my mom always tells me I need to get a haircut, and this is the time when I feel like she's right. But if the sound is weird, just tell me, and I'll, I'll try to fix it, okay? All right, so things that Jesus never said. Um, do you know that passage at the end what did I say? Do you know that passage at the end of John's gospel? It's, it's so poetic and it's beautiful. And John says, this is how he ends his gospel. This is the disciple who testifies to these things and who wrote them down. We know that his testimony is true. Jesus did many other things as well. If every one of them were written down, I suppose that even the whole world would not have room for the books that would be written. Isn't that beautiful? Um, I have the opposite side of that. If I were to write down all the things that Jesus didn't say, I wouldn't be able to fit all of those things in all the books in all the world. And so what we've chosen is we've chosen four topics that are kind of common, common things you may hear uh, in, in our culture that sometimes people think are straight out of the Bible, but that Jesus never never actually said these things. Um, I've come up with a few other things that Jesus didn't say, though. And so other things that Jesus never said, Jesus never said, pass the bacon. <laughs> Did not say it. Um, Jesus never said, where are my glasses? Jesus never said, I will judge your land if you vote for the wrong person. Never said that. Um, he never said, synchronize your watches to the disciples. And he also never said that the designated hitter is a good idea. <laughs> this was not something that he said. Now, sometimes 
the idea of basing our theology on what Jesus didn't say can get us into some trouble, right? Because sometimes you hear people say, well, you know, Jesus didn't say it, and so therefore we can't base our, our belief on it, even though it's in lots of other places in the Bible. I blame whoever invented red ink for this, for this idea. Because Jesus, let's just be frank, Jesus never said you shouldn't marry your sister. He, he never said it. Should you marry your sister? No. For the video, you should not marry your sister, even though Jesus never said it. Because Jesus did say in, in Matthew 5, in, during the Sermon on the Mount, do not think that I have come to abolish the law and the prophets, meaning the Old Testament. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Therefore, anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commands and teaches, teaches others accordingly will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. And so Jesus, what does he do? He affirms the goodness of God's law. And he tells us not to look to that law for our salvation. We're to look to him for salvation. But the moral, the moral law of the Old Testament is not something that's bad, something that we should ignore, right? What, is, what does the psalmist say? Uh, it says that God's word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. It helps us see what's good. It helps us see what's righteous and ways that we can live our life um, that pleases God. Not perfectly, right? That's why we need a savior. But it's a good thing to do what God tells us to do. Sometimes I feel like a radical for saying something like that. It's a good thing to do what God wants us to do. So today, we're looking at Jesus never said, follow your heart. As long as you're happy, be true to yourself. Also known as Disney Jesus. <laughs> right? That's the plot of countless Disney movies. Follow your heart or follow your dreams. All of your dreams will come true. That's not exactly what Jesus tells us life is going to be like. Now, I think when we think of things like follow your heart, <clears throat> we think of verses like this one. I bet you've heard this one before. Take delight in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Do you know that one? That's a really good one. Um, I'm, not, I'm not saying anything today that's counter to this at all. Take delight in the Lord, and he will give you, what did I say? My mom was right. Take delight in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. The problem with that is we get the order backwards. Sometimes we want the desires of our heart and ask the Lord to bless that instead of taking delight in him first. Janis Joplin famously sang, Oh, Lord, won't you buy me a Mercedes Benz? My friends all drive Porsches. I must make amends. Worked hard all my lifetime. No help from my friends. So, oh, Lord, won't you buy me a Mercedes Benz? St. Augustine actually said something similar. St. Augustine said, uh, Lord, give me chastity and give me continence, but not yet. <laughs> this, was, this was young St. Augustine. And it's funny, but we do this all the time. We ask the Lord for patience right after we get what we want. Think about what you may be holding on to in your life. Lord, give me a happy marriage when I wind down this affair in six weeks. Lord, make me sober after football season. Lord, make me generous after my portfolio reaches that certain level. So many things that we use to keep God at arm's length and to push God away. Sometimes we even try to keep him away with good things when we take things that are good and yet we make them into ultimate things, right? It's, n it's a good thing to provide for your family. It's a good thing to leave a legacy for your grandchildren and your great-grandchildren. It's just not good to make that ultimate. So when we're trying to counteract the idea of just follow your heart, this is the verse that my mind goes to. Jeremiah 17. The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. And who can understand it? 
Have you ever felt that way about yourself? Have you ever like reached a point in your life where you don't trust, where you don't trust your heart, or you realize that sometimes you can't trust your own motivations? Right? When you want something um, almost idolatrously that you know is wrong for you, right? That's what that's what Jeremiah is talking about in this verse. That the heart is deceitful. And why is it deceitful? Because we've got a problem, and our problem is sin. So God created the world. He created everything good. He creates uh, man and woman, and he calls it very good. And he set them in this perfect garden, and he gave them a job. He told them to fill the earth and to subdue it and to bring everything under their reign as they were under his reign. And what did they do? They sinned. They went against what God had told them. They decided to trust their own judgment rather than trusting God's. And that's how sin came into the world. And so now, here we're, we're like these, the, the image that I've heard before, it's like that we're um, glorious ruins. You ever been to like ruins of like a great castle that's kind of fallen into disrepair? That's what our hearts are like. God created us with dignity and with, to be glorious and to be with him, and yet sin has come in and has tainted those things which are good. And so sometimes, this is why we take things that are good and we turn them into things that are ultimate. Or we take things like craving, um, craving relationships, right? And we take those and we make those things ultimate and we make them into idols. Uh, the theologian John Calvin said that the human heart is an idol factory, right? that we're constantly um, creating idols, things that we worship instead of God, worshiping the creator of uh, the created instead of the creator. See, the fall affected everything. When sin came into the world, it affected everything, including our hearts, including our desires. And so now we desire things that we shouldn't. What does Paul say in Romans 7? Remember this passage? The, the things that I want to do, I don't. And the things that I don't want to do, I do. Oh, who will save me from this body of sin? What's, what's the answer to that question, by the way? Who will save him? Jesus, right? That's the whole reason for that. But we have these desires that we work against through the power of the Spirit. And that's called big vocabulary word for the day, sanctification. In, in the church, you know how we, there's a part in the service we call it the sanctus. Right, what is that? What do we say in the sanctus? Holy, 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 right? Holy, 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 Lord God of hosts. Sanctification comes from the same root word of sanctus. It means holy. It means holiness. It, it refers to how God is constantly at work in our hearts, making us more holy and making us more like him. It refers to, if you're watching this on video later on in the week, I really apologize that you're constantly um, changing your volume. It's my fault because of my hair. Um, There we go. So sanctification is how God is at work in our hearts through the power of the Spirit. One of my favorite passages that I come back to again and again and again is where Paul writes that the same God who began his good work in us will be faithful to bring it to completion. Right? That you didn't wake up this morning and this is as good as it's going to get in your life. God's not finished with you. Right? You might be 18 you might be 88. You may be somewhere between those. You may be somewhere on either extreme of those. But God did not finish with you. And he did not just give up on you. Right? The same God who began his good work in you will be faithful to bring that good work to completion. And that's sanctification. That's the process of dying to ourselves and living unto God. Right? That's the, the daily dying and resurrecting that we trust that the power of the Spirit will be doing in our lives. That's why we can try to do what God tells us to do in the law. Right? That's, we're not going to do it perfectly, and we rely on the Spirit, but those things are good to do. It's good to love your neighbor. Right? It's good to do the things that are in the Ten Commandments. Those are good things for us to do. And that's done through the work of the Spirit in sanctification. Okay? Any questions so far? I want to make sure I don't just blow past everything. 
All right, let's keep going. Here's something Jesus did say. I'll read the passage around it, starting in Matthew 6. Jesus said, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? It's homecoming season right now. Why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow? They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. So Jesus tells us, to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to us as well. Sounds suspiciously like that verse that we talked about at the very beginning, Psalm 37, 4. Take delight in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Right? You've got to, we've got to get that in the right order, though. Take delight in the Lord, and then he'll give you the desires of your heart. does not mean... Take delight in the Lord, and then you can manipulate him into getting those things that you always wanted, into getting that Mercedes Benz, right? That's not the desires of your heart. If you take delight in the Lord, what's going to happen to those desires? They're going to change, right? That's sanctification. That's the work of God in our hearts, that we'll start to crave those things which are good because we're putting our hope and our faith in the place that it was supposed to be placed in all along. Have you ever come to, like you were woken up one morning and you realized that something that you had prayed about five or ten years earlier, that, that God had actually done it and you hadn't been aware of it at all? Has this ever happened to you? Or you've prayed for something like patience? Or you've prayed for God's perseverance in a time where you're just going through, just going through the ringer? And then you wake up and it's been five or ten years and you realize without you even recognizing in the moment that God has been faithful and that he has taken care of you. And those things that you used to crave, you don't crave them as much anymore. And those things that used to drive all of your, um, drive all of your energies and drive your affections, that God has slowly, right, and sometimes painfully, but has changed those things to make you more and more into, into his likeness. Have you ever noticed that or is that just me? Have you noticed it? Good. I hope so. Because God, like I said, He's not done with you. He's still working. He's not finished with you yet. Um, famously, Saint Augustine, so St. Augustine said, I give me chastity, but not yet. That was as a young man. He, through his own process of sanctification, God wasn't done with him. Here's what he said later in life. Love God and do whatever you please. But you have to do it in that order, right? Love God and do whatever you please. For the soul trained in love to God will do nothing to offend the one who is beloved. All right, so if we love God, if that's our primary motivation in all things, then if we do what we please, what do we please? The things that please us are going to be the things that honor God. But we've got to get it in the right order. Not do what you please and then see if God, see if God will um, give you an A for that. C.S. Lewis I think you've probably heard this before. C.S. Lewis says, if we consider the unblushing promises of the reward and the staggering nature of the rewards promised in the Gospels, it would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. So the things that our heart craves, Lewis is saying, God doesn't think that we're wanting things too much. He just thinks that we, we have our eyes set on the wrong thing. 
We are half-hearted creatures, fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us, like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. We are far too easily pleased. I love that. It's from his essay called, uh, actually it's a sermon, called The Weight of Glory. We are far too easily pleased. We set our eyes on small things when God wants us to set our eyes on things that are ultimate. Right? Jesus tells us to pray that God's kingdom would come on earth as it is in heaven. How is God's kingdom in heaven? It's perfect. And so we ask that his will would be done on earth perfectly in the same way that his will is done in heaven. That's a big ask. That's far beyond what, what, what I, I'll just speak for myself, that's far beyond what I pray for on a daily basis. Usually the things that I'm praying for, I'm praying the Lord's Prayer, but I'm praying, Lord, please help my children to please pay attention in school. Please help them when they take these tests. SAT prep is coming. Lord, please have mercy on us, right? Let me not get stuck in traffic for an extra 45 minutes today and just make it home so I can make dinner. Those are the things that I'm praying for, which are good things to pray for, by the way. There was nothing, I don't think there was anything selfish. Maybe the SAT thing. Um, but God wants us to set our eyes on those things, but also things that are much bigger in scope, right? To look at the world around us and say, God, where there's injustice, come and work through people who are following um, who are following you to bring justice where there is injustice and to bring mercy where there is nothing but suffering, right? Those are the kinds of things that we can set our eyes on and ask that God would do. C.S. Lewis, um, he had a favorite author. Many of our favorite author is C.S. Lewis. He had a favorite author. His name was George MacDonald. And this is what George MacDonald wrote. I bet you haven't heard this, and this is really good. Even such as ask amiss may sometimes have their prayers answered. The father will never give the child a stone that asks for bread. Are you familiar with that passage? Jesus says, how many of you, if your child comes to you and asks for, a, for bread, are, are going to give him a stone? Or they ask for a fish and you're going to give him a snake? Right? None of you would do that. How much more would your father in heaven give you good things if you, being wicked, would still give your, would still give your uh, children those things? The father will never give the child a stone that asks for bread, but I'm not sure that he will never give the child a stone that asks for a stone. If the father says, my child, that is a stone, it is no bread, and the child answer, I am sure it is bread, I want it. May it not be well that he should try his bread? Another way to say that is, sometimes God gives you what you ask for. And some of you are nodding your heads and you know that sometimes that's not what you want. Right? The things that you ask for are not the things that are best for you. Um, sometimes this, is, this idea can be used to, um, to, kind of, to kind of push us toward a detachment from the world. Right? Don't want things. Yeah, please. Wesley's going to save you all. Thank you. Thank you, Wesley. Do you still need this for the video? No? no? Okay, good. All right, cue some music while I'm doing this. Boom, 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 boom. All right, there we go. So, Sometimes this can be used to, to push us towards kind of a detachment from the world, kind of a, a sense of, oh, we just have to let go of our desires. Have you heard that before? Right, let go of your desires, and then you'll truly be pleasing God. That's, that's not the idea at all, right? What did, what did Lewis say? That our desires are not too strong, our desires are too weak. Right, so it's, it's good to have desires, things like, wanting to have relationships with other people. Those are good things. We don't just, God, I'm going to let this go. It's like, it's like hunger, right? God, I'm just going to let go of my hunger. No, it's okay for you to go and make dinner or pray that God would, you know, if you're someone who's destitute, to pray that God would send them food. That's not a bad thing. Our desires, 
it's okay to have desires. The, the thing is, we just have to have, we have to desire the right things and not the wrong things. Or desire the right things in a way that makes them ultimate. And so, if you have desires, things like companionship, things like um, wanting to have, have children, and God hasn't met those desires for whatever reason, it's okay to mourn some of those things. Right? So the, some of those things are a result of the fall because sin is in the world. Like our bodies get sick and we die because there is sin in the world. And so it's okay to mourn those things. Death is not, oh, it's just a natural part of life. No, death is the enemy. And it's okay to mourn when there's death. Now, we don't mourn as those without hope, right? We, we trust that Jesus' his resurrection is the first fruits of our own resurrection, and he will bring life where there has been death. But you don't have to detach yourself and just, oh, isn't it a beautiful thing? It's part of life. No, it's a bad thing. Death is bad, right? And we trust that Jesus will renew our bodies when we die. Like, that's what... That's part of our faith, that it's okay to have desires. It's okay to mourn those things in the world that are bad. Sometimes the desires of our heart are for good things, and yet in God's providence, he has not seen fit to grant them. Remember Paul talking about the thorn in the flesh? Right? We don't know what that was, but he kept, he said that the Lord gave him this, he called it a thorn in the flesh. That was his metaphor. This thing that he asked him three times to get rid of, and yet the Lord never did. And yet, God was still faithful, even though he didn't remove that thing from St. Paul's life. I, I came across this this week. Um, one of my favorite authors posted it online, and he posted it because he really wanted to show off the stonework. Um, <clears throat> this is the tomb of William Blake, the poet. And I don't know if you can see it. It gets a little bit dark. It's from one of his poems. I'm just going to read it to you in case it's too dark for you. Um, I think it's great. He says, I give you the end of a golden string. Only wind it into a ball. It will lead you in at heaven's gate built in Jerusalem's wall. I just think that's a beautiful image for the way that we live our lives. Right? We don't know everything set out in front of us. We just have to live faithfully day to day for what God has revealed to us. And what has he revealed? He, he's revealed to us, well, he's revealed to us that he wants us to walk humbly, to love mercy, right? to love him, to pray that he would be at work in our lives. This was a, I give you the end of a golden string, only wind it into a ball. It will lead you in at heaven's gate, built in Jerusalem's wall. I thought that was beautiful. All right, Jeremiah, I'm almost done, by the way, so I have plenty of time for questions, comments, snide remarks, so prepare those right now. Um, <clears throat> you may have seen this verse on coffee cups. Jeremiah, it's the second one here, Jeremiah 29, 11, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. And that's beautiful, and it's true. But let me give you some context. Let's start with verse 10. This is what the Lord says, When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my good promise to bring you back to this place. So he's telling them, you're about to suffer for 70 years. He's talking about the exile. Right? God's people have been wicked, and the image that he uses is the land is holy, the people are not, and so the land is about to like, spit them out because the land itself can't deal with their wickedness. He's going to drive them out, and yet in 70 years, he's going to bring them back. Then he says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. It's amazing that that verse comes right after a promise that there is going to be some suffering, right? Jesus says, um, in this world, you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. We're not going to be able to avoid suffering, but the Lord has promised that he will be with us through that suffering, right? Del delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. 
The last verse that I want to show you is this one. This is from the end of Ephesians. And I thought this was perfect because when we think about, excuse me, when we think about our heart's desires or our, to make it even more Disney-fied, our dreams, right, to follow our dreams, this is what Paul writes in Ephesians 3. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine. Immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine. So those things that we want, those things that are good that we might try to make ultimate, God has for us infinitely more than that. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. So that's my take on just follow your heart. Questions. Anybody have any questions? I know I'm done a little bit early. I, I talk fast, and I apologize if I was too fast. I used to teach middle school, and it was, it was a help when I was teaching middle school because I would use so many words they couldn't really keep up, and then they wouldn't do weird things. Yes? No, I don't know where it, just just follow your heart. I mean, I think it probably came from somebody that heard this and thought, "Hey, that's good. Let me shorten this down to just follow your heart." I think he asked where the the saying "just just follow your heart" came from. I guess that's what I would say. Any any other ideas? Has anybody had heard a source or read an author something like that? Yeah. Jiminy Cricket. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> she just quoted, when you wish upon a star and said it's not true. By the way, Jiminy Cricket, same voice as, anybody know? Otis the town drunk from Mayberry. Same actor. You didn't think you'd be learning that today, did you? <laughs> yes. question is, isn't it good to have hopes and dreams? Am I summarizing this well, Alex? Isn't it good to have hopes and dreams? And by saying um, sometimes that's bad and calling it Dis pejoratively calling it Disney Jesus, isn't that, couldn't that necessarily be discouraging people who are just starting out in their faith? Thank you. Um, I agree. I probably see uh, Disney a little bit I don't see Disney, kind of Disney, that's, a, that's an easy way to say this, since this is going on the internet. <laughs> be careful. I don't have to be careful, I taught middle school. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, I hope that you didn't hear, that I didn't hit the idea of, that our heart is deceptive, t so hard that it didn't say that having dreams, that having dreams are good, they seem to be the right dreams need to be the right hopes. And so, so telling someone who's new in their faith, um, it's good to want those things. Like, you know, what's the one that always happens with, um, like, high schoolers, college age? How, you tell me God loves me. How can you tell me that's true when nobody wants to date me? Right? That comes up a lot when you're talking to high schoolers or college age students. Right? And so what do you, what do you tell somebody like that? 
it's good to want to have relationships, right? God did, make, did not make us to be on our own. It's good to crave that. It's not good to feel that in um, unhealthy ways, but it's good to want to have relationships with other people. And so you affirm that, and then you say, but we don't treat that as if it's ultimate, that somehow God has failed if something like that doesn't happen and doesn't come true for us. And so, yeah, I think you're right, Alex. I, I, don't, want to, um, I don't want to say that dreams and hopes and are, are bad at all. I think they're good and that we should pray that God would, would shape those towards things that are healthy and towards things that are good. That's all I got to say about that. Yes? Absolutely. Yeah, I, I didn't, I cut that part out, but yeah, the, the prosperity gospel. Do you know the prosperity gospel? If God is happy with you, you will receive blessings in this world. Do you know, do you know? that's a very shorthand way of saying it. Um, <clears throat> it's not built entirely on lies. Have you read Proverbs? Right? Like if you, if you make wise decisions, God will prosper you in this world. That's kind of the basis behind wisdom literature. Um, it, it just needs to be nuanced and said, Yes, but we do live in a sinful world. So if, things, if everything was working the way that it should, when you do the right things, you should get blessings from that. I'm good with that. But, but this world is not a perfect world. It's a, it's a fallen world. And sometimes we can do our best and we don't prosper, right? We make that investment that seems like it's a no-brainer and it craters. And yet, does that mean that God doesn't love us? Not at all. Right? There, there will be suffering in this life, but what we can look to is that we have a God who is familiar with suffering and has borne our sin upon himself so that we're not alone whenever we suffer. Yeah, thank you for bringing that up. Other questions? I feel like I have three minutes because I see 1052, so I feel really good about having three minutes left. Anybody else? I hmm. Yeah, and don't don't beat up on yourself too much. If there's if there's another lesson from this, don't beat up on yourself too much because God's not done with you. And so sometimes you do the best you can in the position that God has put you in at that moment. And if you didn't have some insight that, man, I really wish I had known that 20 years ago, but you didn't, right? And so you try to live faithfully in the moment. That's something that we see in, in the book of Ruth, by the way, which if this was a little bit depressing, very happy Ruth sermon next, next hour. Um, but that's something we see is that you live faithfully in the moment that God has given you at that time, right? You don't, you don't have God's view of everything, and, that's, and it's, so it's okay. And so have, have grace with others and with yourself um, when you are doing the best that you can. Repent of what you need to repent of and trust that God is at work in your life. Anybody else? One more. I think the questions were better than the lesson. Thank you. Good job. All right, if not, then I want to close us by praying but I'm going to conclude the prayer with that passage from Ephesians because that was really good. All right, let's pray. The Lord be with you. Almighty God, we thank you that you are at work in us and that if we delight ourselves in you, that you will give us the desires of our hearts. We pray, Lord, that you would be working in our hearts through the power of the Holy Spirit to mold us into your likeness, that you would help us to love you, you would help us to love others, and that you would help us 
as we live our lives faithfully in the day to day. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Next week, you got a reverend doctor again. Uh, things Jesus said, week four, everything happens for a reason. Special guest, the reverend doctor, sorry, I messed up, the reverend canon doctor, you can ask him what that means. The Reverend Canon Dr. Victor Lee Austin is going to be here. Um, it's going to be really good. I think he's got a book, too. Um, Everything Happens for a Reason. I think his book is on suffering. Um, yeah, so it, it should be good. So you should come back next week. All right, thank you.